Hello and welcome to your chapter 10 video lecture where we are going to talk about muscle tissue. First, let's do an overview of the muscles. All types of our muscle tissue are going to exhibit excitability, which means that our plasma membrane can change the electrical state and send a electrical wave, which we can call an action potential or a nerve impulse along the entire length of that membrane. So we'll see some illustrations as to how that happens in the coming slides. When a muscle contracts, the muscle fibers are shortened and this will take place when that myosin protein pulls on the actin protein. As far as the functions of muscle tissue, it's going to help us with our posture. It allows us to remain sitting or standing. We'll also have joint stabilization, as we talked about in chapter nine, and protects our organs. For instance, your abdominal muscles are covering and protecting your abdominal organs. We've got no um, skeletal bones covering that area. And then we also have heat generation that will take place, which results from the muscles contracting and breaking down their ATP. And as a result, its byproduct is going to be heat. And this helps us to maintain our normal body temperature, especially when we are at colder environments and need to bring our body temperature up. And it'll assist with cardiovascular and lymphatic vessels. So that's what you're seeing pictured here on the right hand side. The skeletal muscle alongside a vein or a lymphatic vessel will contract and that will help to move the fluid. Sometimes it's going to be blood, other times it's going to be lymph through that vessel. And as it moves through, the valves can also close up and catch the fluid trying to move on backward. And these valves help to ensure that it moves in one direction. But the main goal of this presentation is to understand that the skeletal muscle contracting and putting pressure on those vessels also helps move that fluid in one direction. Okay, so there are three major types of muscles. We've got our skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscle. We are going to focus on skeletal muscle in this lecture, and they are going to deal with voluntary stimulation, meaning that these skeletal muscles that attach to bone are going to be under our conscious control. Our fibers here are going to appear striped, so they are going to have this striated appearance, which if you look over here at our cardiac muscle, it too is going to have that striated appearance. And our skeletal muscle will allow external movement and are developed through exercise. Let's talk about the other types of muscle tissue next. So next we've got our smooth muscles, and this is under involuntary control. And we call it smooth muscle because as you can see through the illustrations here and this histology micrograph, we can see that it is not striated as we saw the skeletal muscle to be and cardiac muscle to be. So where are we gonna use this type of muscle? We'll find it lining within certain organs, our blood vessels, the airways within our respiratory tract and allow for internal movement. And what's interesting about these um, smooth muscle cells is that they have this tapered look to them. So they're a little bit thicker in the center and they taper out to the side here. So they're gonna be shorter cells, especially when compared to our skeletal muscle cells. And when they contract, they just pull in toward the center. And so if you can imagine these cells lining the middle layer of our blood vessels, let's say within an artery or within a vein, which is gonna have less of this smooth muscle, we will be able to change the blood vessels diameter. And so when we contract the smooth muscle, we are going to get a more narrow diameter and we call that vasoconstriction. And when we relax the muscle, it dilates the blood vessel and that is called vasodilation. And lastly, we have cardiac muscle tissue. This is also completely involuntary and it's a specialized muscle with that striated appearance to it. You don't quite see the striations in this 
a pictograph as well in this micrograph as well but we do see it illustrated over here so we solely will find cardiac muscle in the heart and the contraction of our muscle will cause the heartbeat and internal movement and we could see that interesting arrangement of this cardiac muscle within the heart and we are going to talk about this a lot more once we get into our cardiovascular system just note for now that most of our cardiac muscle cells are going to have a centrally located nucleus and we have this appearance of intercalated discs which are gap junctions in which ions can easily flow from one cell to another now let's go back to skeletal muscle we know that this type of muscle will attach to bones and provide movement for our body but we use some other terms to refer to some attachments as well for instance the term ligaments refers to dense connective tissue that will attach bone to bone and some muscles will attach directly to bone or to soft tissue without a tendon or it can attach via a tendon. This is going to be fibrous tissue that attaches skeletal muscle to the bone itself. So you can see some examples of that in the foot over here. With our tendons, they have some fibers that are intertwining with the periosteum. So when we talk about that periosteum, remember that's that outer layer of our bone and that will allow the muscle to attach to the bone. Other times we have muscles that form tendons known as flattened tendons, and they're made up of a fibrous sheath. So right along in here, this is a transverse cut of the abdomen. So we can see if I'm pointing right in this area or it's referring to this area, same thing. And so that where they all come together, these fibrous sheaths of tendon is called a aponeurosis. Again, this is just a fancy word to mean flattened tendon. And that can attach to coverings of adjacent muscles. And eventually for this rectus abdominis muscle, we're gonna see that aponeurosis kind of forms sheaths going around either side and then we'll come together here at the linea alba, the middle line that we see along the abdomen. Our skeletal muscle is voluntary because it's controlled by conscious thought. So like we said, it'll be responsible for movement and maintaining our posture, and it can also generate heat. So we use the term muscle to mean all contractile tissue. And the contractile property of our muscle tissue allows it to become short and thick as a result. And you could see this well on from the top image over here in which we are going to see the myosin heads will attach to the actin myofilaments, bringing it, it, bringing it in closer to the midline and we get this shortened, thicker result. And this is due to a nerve impulse that is coming in through some mechanisms that we'll talk about in the coming slides. And then once we have contracted, the impulse is removed and the muscle can go back to its relaxed state. Before we get into those mechanisms, let's talk about the organization of skeletal muscle. Our cells within this tissue are called muscle fibers and our muscle tissue is constructed through bundles of these fibers. So it's a really organized structure and each of our muscle fibers are about the size of a human hair. Each muscle is going to serve as an organ and we'll see structures or tissues such as connective tissue, blood vessels, and nerves within our skeletal muscle. Let's go through the connective tissue sheaths of our skeletal muscle that allows for this organization. We've got our epimyceum that is going to serve as our connective tissue that is made up of dense regular connective tissue that surrounds the entire muscle itself. Then you could see that within this bundle here, we are going to have a bunch of muscle 
fascicles. Muscle fascicles are the muscle fibers bundled together. So surrounding each of these muscle fascicles then will be the perimyceum. This is a fibrous connective tissue, again, that surrounds the muscle fascicle. And then if we look within that muscle fascicle, we can see our groups of muscle fibers right along in here. And each muscle fiber is going to have an endomyceum covering it. That will be made up of fine areolar connective tissue. And like we said, surrounds the muscle fiber. And when we look at a muscle fiber up close, we can see it has a sarcolemma, which means the cell membrane and within it, we are going to have myofibrils. Now let's talk about how that nerve and our blood vessels are going to supply the muscle tissue. Our nerves and vessels will branch repeatedly, and our smallest nerve branch serves individual muscle fibers. As that nerve is reaching over to supply the muscle, we will see that it will create something known as a neuromuscular junction, where the neuro nerve is coming together with the muscle. And as the impulse moves through the nerve, it is going to tell the nerve to release a neurotransmitter known as acetylcholine that will go and attach to acetylcholine receptors on the muscle cell. More on that in just a bit. So you may have recognized that prefix sarco when we talked about the sarcolemma here. That prefix sarco means muscle. And as I said in the previous slide, sarcolemma refers to the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. Then we've got our T tubules, which let me fast forward to the slide ahead where you can see depicted over here is our sarcolemma, and those T-tubules are invaginations of that plasma membrane moving across our myofibril. And the last thing I'll mention on this slide is the space or fluid that we find in between the myofibrils here. You can also see there's some mitochondria sitting along here, and that is going to be called the sarcoplasm just like the cytoplasm within our cell, how it's a fluid and it helps to suspend organelles, that is what is happening here in our muscle cell. So it's referring to this light pink space all along in here. Next structure we have is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. You may think that sounds a little familiar, and it was a special name given to the endoplasmic reticulum of our muscle cell, specifically the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is going to help to store, release, and retrieve calcium ions within the muscle cell. So you can see too that we've got these parallel, almost tube looking like structures sitting alongside the transverse or T-tubule that we discussed previously. And we would call this the triad where they come together. As we've mentioned before, each muscle cell is going to be an elongated fiber known as a muscle fiber. And what's unique about skeletal muscle cells is that they can be up to 12 inches in length and sometimes even longer depending on the individual. And each of these muscle fibers are going to contain myofibrils. Now along this myofibril, we are going to have something called sarcomeres. Sarcomeres are going to be our structural and functional units of our muscle fiber or muscle cell. And so if we look at what a sarcomere looks like, and by the way, these are going to be repeated throughout the myofibril. So we could have a sarcomere here, a sarcomere here, a sarcomere here. They're all attached back to back. And so we'll see that each will have two types of thread-like structures called thick and thin myofilaments. 
the thick myofilaments, which we see in the purple here, are made up of a protein called myosin, whereas the yellow here is representing our thin myofilaments that is made up of the protein actin. Now, how do these myofilaments work together? The sarcomere is going to be the smallest contractile unit of our muscle cell. And the region of the myofibril between two successive Z discs, or sometimes we can call them Z lines, will be where that sarcomere sits. And you could see extending out from those Z lines, we first have our thin myofilaments, which are known as our actin proteins. And you could see that they're made up of these single subunits that are ball-like structures that attach to one another and then another thread is created in the same way and they are intertwined. Something else to note about our actin filaments is that they are going to have proteins associated with them such as tropo, uh, troponin and tropomyosin which is this rope looking like structure. We're going to talk about them more in just a little bit but the last thing I want to draw your attention to is that along each of those ball subunit actin uh, structures will be a attachment site called the active site or the binding site for myosin. So notice how those are covered up right now with this string-like structure which we call tropomyosin. Now if you look more toward the center of the sarcomere we will see our thick myofilaments also known as myosin and when we look at a close-up of that protein structure we'll see that it has multiple heads. I always say they look like a bunch of golf clubs kind of tied together with the club heads sticking out. But when we look closer up at what those heads look like, it almost looks like a boxing glove of some sort. So these myosin heads are going to have special sites for ATP to bind to and special sites to bind to actin. So essentially these binding sites here are going to attach to the binding site or active site here on our actin proteins. So now let's learn about those special proteins that have to do with our thin myofilament, the actin myofilament. So if we first mentioned the jump rope looking like structure here in the orange. That is our tropomyosin and it is going to cover up those binding sites for the myosin heads when the muscle is relaxed. Then we have our tropomyosin, which is serving as a regulatory protein as well, and it's made up of three subunits. So if you can see this illustration I've created here, we've got our three subunits of troponin, and each of these will bind to something different. We will see that calcium can bind to it, the actin, protein and tropomyosin. So when we are in a rested state, the muscle is rested I should say, we are going to have that tropomyosin cover up the binding sites on actin. But when calcium binds to troponin, it is going to cause a conformational change in shape to troponin which then pulls that tropomyosin out of the way revealing the binding sites and now the myosin head can bind to the actin filament. So how do we get this muscle to contract? We are going to have the nerve impulse come in and send it through through the muscle in that neuromuscular junction. So here we are seeing our motor neuron. It is going to have its axon terminals, which you see enlarged over here, meet the muscle fiber. And the, <coughs> excuse me, the place that this axon terminal is meeting the muscle fiber is called a motor end plate, basically where we have these invaginations within the sarcolemma of the muscle cell. Every skeletal muscle fiber in every skeletal muscle is innervated by a motor neuron. And like we said, that is at our neuromuscular junction.
So once we have that transition take place where we are able to make these acetylcholine molecules attached to their receptors, they are going to allow sodium to move into the muscle cell. So let's take a look at that and then explain the membrane potential going on inside the cell. So when we take a look at what ions are outside of the muscle cell and what we find inside the muscle cell, there is a big difference. This in the muscle cell is called the membrane potential. It's the potential gradient that forces ions to passively move in one direction. So when we look at the inside of our muscle cell, we are going to find beyond that membrane inside of the cell that we will have a membrane potential of negative 60 to negative 90 millivolts. And our neurons and muscle cells can use their membrane potentials to generate electrical signals. And as we're generating those electrical signals, they are going to be called action potentials. This is a special type of electrical signal that can travel along this cell membrane as a wave. So a skeletal muscle fibers membrane must first be excited to be able to fire that action potential. Once we get that action potential to move from the nerve over to our sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of the muscle cell, it is then going to travel down the sarcolemma and through those T-tubules. And because those T-tubules are so close in proximity to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, there are receptors and channels in here that will then allow the calcium to be released from the SR, which will then travel to the troponin protein on the actin and allow troponin to shift tropomyosin, that rope-like structure, out of the way so that the myosin head can bind to actin. Actin can then produce something called a power stroke, pulling the actin filament in, shortening the sarcomere, resulting in a contraction. So let's take a closer look at that neuromuscular piece to it. Our motor neuron is going to originate from the spinal cord and then extend to our skeletal muscle cell where it's going to transmit its impulse, its action potential over a long distance. Eventually that action potential will arrive at the axon terminal here where we have these synaptic vesicles we call them that contain the neurotransmitter in this case for skeletal muscle, it's going to be acetylcholine, and they are found inside the vesicles as we said. These vesicles then re will release acetylcholine through a process known as exocytosis. Exocytosis means that these vesicles are going to move up toward the neuron, um, neuron's axon terminal and release the chemical, the acetylcholine, that then is going to move through a space that is called the synaptic cleft. The space here is called the synaptic cleft. And then it will bind to its specific receptor on the motor end plate. So you could see these red dots representing acetylcholine. It attaches to the receptor. Now note that acetylcholine itself is not moving into the muscle cell. Instead, it opens up this channel to allow the sodium to move into the muscle cell. Note that this area where we have the invagination of the sarcolemma is called the motor end plate, and this is where we're going to find those acetylcholine receptors. We can also call this acetylcholine ligand receptors. So like I said, this is going to open up the acetylcholine receptor, allowing the positively charged sodium ions to move into the cell. And so as it moves inside of the cell, these positive ions make the inside of the cell more positive. So let's take a look at these images down here. This is our muscle cell at rest. This is a little probe 
that is measuring the voltage inside of the cell and it's showing us that it is at negative 70. We see all of the sodium outside of the cell here. We do have some uh, potassium channels and sodium channels that are remained closed right now and we always have our sodium potassium pump working that is going to pump three sodium ions out and potassium ions in. This is all happening when we're at rest. The muscle is not contracting here. But when we have a process called depolarization take place, that means we have some sodium channels that are opening up, allowing sodium to move inside of the cell. That makes the cell become, or I should say the inside of the cell become more positive. So it moves from negative 70 up to zero millivolts. So again, depolarization makes the inside of the cell more positive loss of the difference in charge between the inside and the outside. So the outside is relatively positive, right? So as we're moving from negative 70 to zero, we are depolarizing it. When it's polarized, that means it's positive outside, negative inside. And so as we're becoming more positive in here, we are depolarizing it. And this is due to a change in the cell's permeability. Remember, permeability means how easily we are allowing substances to move in and out of the cell. So by opening up the sodium channel, we are able to change the permeability and let more sodium into the cell. This causes another set of ion channels to open called voltage-gated sodium channels. And so now we have even more sodium moving into the cell, causing the inside to become more positive and it spreads along the entire membrane. So an area that has depolarized is going to reset through a process called repolarization. We got to go back to rest. And so what we're doing is we are going to allow some of that positive, some of the positive ions inside of the cell to move back outside of the cell. So the inside of the cell will slowly become more negative and we are going to try to go back to negative 70. Sometimes we overshoot this and we get hyperpolarization. Now the acetylcholine, uh, let's go back to that neuromuscular junction. We were releasing acetylcholine from the neuron to go across the synaptic cleft and bind to its acetylcholine receptors, allowing sodium to move in, right? So what we have to do now is the acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft will be degraded by an enzyme known as acetylcholine esterase. Remember, anything that ends with ACE is an enzyme. So we take that acetylcholine, we break it down into acetate and choline. So then we can recycle some of this and recreate our synaptic vesicles for when we need it again. As our AP is continuing down the sarcolemma, it travels to that T-tubule. So this is a little illustration that we have here. This up here is representing our sarcolemma. More and more positive um, sodium is moving into the cell here. That's allowing the action potential to propagate or move along the sarcolemma and then down the T-tubule. So here within the T-tubule, the voltage change causes receptors to open up the calcium channels that are present in our sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's what the purple is representing here. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum is then going to allow calcium to diffuse out of its little storage area here and will travel down <clears throat> to our troponin. Now, if you remember, we had an arrangement of the T-tubule with the membranes of the SR on each side. So we would have another one over here, but I just depicted it on this right side. So that calcium is going to leave, making its way to our myofibrils, and again, specifically will bind to the troponin on our actin myofilaments, these thin filaments here. And by calcium arriving in the sarcoplasm, where these myofibrils are found, it's going to initiate contraction of the sarcomeres. Now we know that that calcium is initiating the contraction and we can start to talk about how ATP is going to allow this process to take place. 
if calcium is in the sarcoplasm, it's going to bind to troponin, and eight, if ATP is available, the muscle will contract. It will shorten. And the sarcomere, you can see here, is shortening as the myosin heads are pulling that actin filament in toward the midline, toward the M line, and as a result, we get the whole muscle shortening and producing tension. Now let's take a look at that sarcomere a little bit more closely. As the, um, or let's let, take a look at the setup before the muscle contracts, before that sarcomere shortens. We have different sections that we call dark bands and light bands. So our dark bands is a region here where we're going to see the thick myosin filaments overlapping with our thin actin filaments. And this creates a dense appearance, a darker appearance. I'm going to go to our lighter eye band over here that is going to consist only of the actin filaments. So these thin filaments are anchored by their Z discs and are going to become smaller during contraction. So because we have no overlap here with the myosins, this is also uh, referred to as the light bands. All right, let's go back to that M line over here. The M line sits in the middle here. It is really helping to anchor the myosin myofilaments. And this area where we do not have actin present, we only have myosin present, is called the H zone. So now let's compare these areas to a contracted sarcomere. You could see as the myosin heads are attaching to actin, pulling it in toward the M line, we see our H zone has nearly disappeared now. Another area where it has become smaller or more narrow is our I band area because now we have more overlap of the myosin with actin and we have very little space where we only have actin filaments. When our sarcomere or our skeletal muscle fiber, fiber contracts, the thin filaments are going to be pulled and slide past the thick filaments within the sarcomere. So here you could see the actin filaments are the green. They are sliding past um, the myosin filaments in the reddish orange toward that midline, that M line. This only occurs when the myosin binding sits, sites on actin filaments are exposed. And that again is because that molecule tropomyosin, and I'll kind of point this out on the next slide, tropomyosin is covering those binding sites. Unless calcium is present and can bind to troponin, moving tropomyosin out of the way. So when we have the troponin and tropomyosin binding together and shifting that tropomyosin out of the way, we are going to call that troponin-tropomyosin complex. Like we said, that calcium is going to bind to troponin. That will shift the tropomyosin out of the way and allow access to those binding sites on the actin so the myosin head can attach. And at that point, we can slide the actin across the thick filaments, and then the myosin head can recock and can go through this process all over again, further pulling in the actin filament. This repeats again and again, and as the myosin head connects to actin, we call this a cross bridge. So when it happens repeatedly, we call it a cross bridge cycle. That cross bridge formation is going to occur again as that myosin head is attaching to the actin. And it's while ADP and an inorganic phosphate are bound to the myosin. Then as the inorganic phosphate is released, it causes the myosin to form a stronger attachment and the myosin head will pull that actin toward the M line. This movement is called a power stroke, a power stroke. And then the myosin head needs ATP to detach itself 
so that it could go through this process again. It'll recock its head back to the original position. And ATP can then be broken down by an enzyme we find in the myosin head known as ATPase that will break ATP down into ADP and inorganic phosphate. This process is called hydrolysis, and it releases the energy that could be stored within the myosin head for it to continue again. We have this condition called rigor mortis that is soon observed after someone dies, and this is due to us not producing any more ATP because, of course, the person has died. So that loss of ATP does not allow the myosin heads to detach from the actin binding sites. So let me go back to this slide over here. Remember the myosin head was attached here? We need ATP in order for it to detach and release from the actin filaments. So when it we don't have ATP present, the myosin head stays attached and our muscles continue to create a cross bridge and stay in place so the muscles stay rigid. The next thing to explore is how do we get this muscle to contract? Where do we get the energy from? And so we're going to talk about the sources of ATP. ATP storage in muscle is going to be very low. Therefore, we have to regenerate this ATP so that we can replace it quickly. So let's talk about some of the mechanisms in which helps us generate this ATP. First, we have our creatine phosphate metabolism. This is when we are going to take our creatine phosphate molecule and we have to have ADP available and utilize a enzyme known as creatine phosphate in order to break off the phosphate from the creatine and add it to ADP so we can get ATP as a result. So when the muscle is at rest, access ATP transfers energy to the creatine, which puts us back here at our creatine phosphate and ADP. We don't need ATP at that moment when the muscle is at rest, but when that muscle activates, then we're going to go through that process I discussed. The creatine phosphate transfers the phosphate to ADP and we get ATP as a result. This is helping to power the first few seconds of muscle contraction. So we really utilize it when we need those very heavy, intense power exercises and has about 15 seconds worth of energy. Then we can utilize our anaerobic glycolysis process and fermentation. This is a non-oxygen dependent process that will break down glucose, which it takes from our blood, so hence our blood glucose or blood sugar, in order pro to produce ATP. So it's going to take more time to produce the ATP through glycolysis than it did the previous creatine phosphate metabolism, and that glucose, like we said, can come from the blood. <clears throat> or we can take it from our muscle glycogen. We're actually going to get a little bit more ATP out of glycogen than we would glucose, um, just to keep that in the back of your head. So if we were to use the blood glucose, we go through the process of glycolysis and we end up with two ATP and two pyruvic acids or pyruvate, we can call it. And that pyruvic acid can then be put into the anaerobic respiration if we have oxygen present. Or when our oxygen levels are low, we can convert it to lactic acid in the blood, which can contribute to muscle fatigue. Now, if all of a sudden oxygen is present, we are able to convert lactic acid back to pyruvate and then go through the anaerobic respiration process in order to create more ATP because our aerobic respiration will yield the most ATP. So this glycolysis process is going to assist with approximately one minute of muscle activity and is used for short bursts of high intensity output. Just a side note, if we were to use uh, muscle glycogen, the result would be 3 ATP instead of the 2 ATP, but we would still get the 2 pyruvic acids.
For aerobic respiration, we would use products from the breakdown of glucose and other nutrients present uh, with oxygen. We could see the oxygen coming in here to produce carbon dioxide, our water, H2O, and lots of ATP. And of course, we get heat as a byproduct too. We're going to have a protein called myoglobin that is able to store some small amounts of excess oxygen that we can utilize for this process. So all in all, 95% of ATP is required for a resting or moder moderately active muscle within the mitochondria. And we can use blood glucose, our pyruvic acid, and fatty acids to go through cellular respiration within the mitochondria. And that can give us 36 ATPs per glucose molecule. This is the slowest process of all, so it is going to be utilized when we have exercises that are longer than a minute. Let's quickly touch back on muscle fatigue. This is gonna take place when our muscle is no longer able to contract in response to the signals from our motor neurons in the nervous system. We're not sure of the exact known cause, but factors have been correlated by the amount of ATP that we have reserved starts to become depleted. So our muscle function may decline as a result. And then lactic acid buildup will take place. There's something called a lactate threshold in which we start to see a lowered intracellular pH because we have more hydrogen ions and it starts to affect enzymes and protein activity in the muscle cell. Then we also have imbalances of the sodium and potassium levels in depolarization that can disrupt the calcium flow of the SR. If we are not getting that action potential propagating a, along the sarcolemma, making its way down the T-tubule, and then causing the channels to open up from the SR to allow calcium to flood out, we are not going to get it binding to troponin and allowing the myosin heads to attach to the active sites causing contraction. And then we've got our long periods of exercise which can cause damage to our SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the sarcolemma, causing them to not function properly. Let's also talk about oxygen depth. This is caused by intense muscle activity and at first, when we start working out, you could see here's our time point moving through based on minutes. Before we even get to one minute, we start to see that we have an oxygen deficit. This means that we don't have enough oxygen present in the moment to use our cellular respiration to create ATP, but eventually, as we are breathing heavily, we gain that oxygen and we can start to see the um, steady state come in over here where we're able to utilize that oxygen to create ATP. Now, when we stop exercising, the theory is that we need to make up for our oxygen that we first started off as a deficit. And oxygen is needed to restore the ATP and creatine phosphate reserves. So that is going to start taking place over here in the green. This used to be called oxygen depth, but now it is called the EPOC, the excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. And we'll start off replacing the phosphate levels for creatine phosphate, and then we'll go through other processes to make up for the other ATP reserves. We can do this by converting, converting that lactic acid to pyruvic acid and creating more ATP in the oxidative phosphorylation process. And in the liver, we can convert lactic acid into glucose or glycogen for storage. Now let's talk about relaxation of the skeletal muscle. It's going to begin by that motor neuron stopping its release of acetylcholine into our neuromuscular junction. We can also utilize acetylcholine esterase to break down the acetylcholine so it stops attaching to the receptors. And then our muscle fibers are going to repolarize. So we are going to start sending that calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Without that calcium being present, 
and attaching to troponin, the tropomyosin protein is going to reshield the actin binding sites of the actin filament, and now our muscle is going to start to lose that tension and relax back to its original state. Now what about muscle strength? When we look at individuals, we see that the number of muscle fibers are genetically determined. So strength is related to the amount of myofibrils and the sarcomeres within each one of those fibers. We do have things like hormones and stress that act on that muscle to increase production and cause a change known as hypertrophy. So when we get hypertrophy, that is increasing the mass and the bulk of the skeletal muscle, but we are not increasing the number of muscle fibers, but just the size of those muscle fibers. We're increasing the size. Whereas if we don't use it, we lose it. So if we are not utilizing these muscles, they go through a process called atrophy, where we are going to see a decrease in the number of sarcomeres. So they are going to disappear along with the myofibrils. And this can happen when one has their limb in a cast and is no longer using those muscles. And there are different types of muscle contractions. We'll start off talking about isometric contraction. This is when we have no change in the length but we have tension that increases. So this typically takes place within our postural muscles, or you can think of when, it's actually being pointed out down here, you can think about when you are holding a weight, just steady in your hand, or if you are trying to push against a wall. You're not gonna be able to move that wall, but you are creating tension within that muscle without changing the length of the muscle. The other types of contractions are called isotonic. In these types of contractions, we do see a change in the length, but the tension is constant. So if we look at concentric contraction first, this means we are overcoming opposing resistance and muscle shortens. So here we're showing a bicep curl, we are causing the biceps muscle to shorten. So you could see here is the full length when we were in that isometric hold, but here the sarcomeres are shortening, causing the whole muscle to contract, allowing us to flex at the elbow. Whereas eccentric contraction, we have tension maintained, but the muscle is going to lengthen. So we're still holding that weight in our hand, but pulling it down. So we can have that muscle longer, but that tension is still present. And when we have muscle tone taking place, this is a constant tension by the muscles for long periods of time. And as we exercise, we are able to keep that muscle toned for longer periods of time. Let's touch upon our motor units. A motor unit is when we have a single motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that is innervated by it. So this depends on the type of muscle, um, what and what we use it for. So when we have larger muscles, we are gonna have motor units with many muscle fibers. So think of your quadriceps femoris muscles or your hamstrings. They are large muscles. They will have motor neurons going to lots and lots of muscle fibers, like thousand muscle fibers. Whereas our smaller muscles, such as the ones that help your eyeball move around, that's gonna make delicate movements that are going to contain motor units with fewer muscle fibers. So think one neuron is going to go to four fibers. And what about recruitment? Each of the motor units are supplied by a neuron that responds to either all or nothing. So what that means is here we could see the different colored motor units going to specific muscle fibers. So if this neuron sends an impulse through, it's not just going to cause this one muscle fiber to contract, it's going to do all of the ones that it has control over, so it'll contract all three of these muscle fibers. 
Now, different motor units are going to be supplied by different neurons and all are going to have different thresholds. At higher levels of stimulation, other motor units with higher thresholds will respond as well. This is called recruitment. Eventually, all of the motor units are going to be activated so that the muscle can fully contract with maximal tension. And that's what we are seeing taking place over here and in this figure. So here we see the stimulus strength is increasing. That neuron is firing, but we have not reached threshold yet. So we are not going to get any stimulation of the muscle, but once we reach that threshold, we are going to be able to get a full response to those muscle fibers. And you can notice in this figure over here that the smaller motor units are going to fire first. So we've got all of them acting first. And then as we need to increase contraction and tension, we are going to recruit the medium sized fibers and then eventually our larger fibers to get our full maximal tension. Let's revisit that threshold stimulus again. Remember when we talked about our resting membrane potential, that was at about negative 70 millivolts inside of the cell. And so we need the inside of the cell to become more positive to reach our threshold, which is going to be at negative 55 millivolts. So if we are to get some positivity inside of the cell, let's say we have some sodium flowing in, we can reach threshold that opens up voltage gated sodium channels, which flood the inside of the cell with sodium, making it more positive and having us reach our action potential at the top. This would be that all response once we hit that threshold. So once the muscle is stimulated, we are going to get contraction. If we don't reach this threshold, if we go back one slide, we are going to get no response. See how this is just below the threshold? So it doesn't matter if we don't reach the threshold, we get the none response. And then of course we need to go through repolarization to reset that muscle. What about the frequency of motor neuron stimulation? When we talk about frequency, we are talking about the number of action potentials that are produced per unit of time. So the closer those action potentials are, the more tension we can create within the muscle. So when we talk about a muscle twitch, this is a single contraction of a muscle. And we could see that pictured over here. We have our latent period, which is going to be from the start of when we get that nerve stimulus to the muscle until we actually get the contraction to take place. So this is assuming that we get that threshold level and action potential takes place. We gain contraction, building up our tension, and then we want to relax. So this is repolarization, allowing that muscle to go back to its lengthened position. If we have a graded muscle response, that's a normal muscle contraction that is sustained and can be modified by input from our nervous system to produce varying amounts of force. We don't want to just turn on all of our muscle fibers to grab a coffee, coffee cup because that's going to be too forceful, right? But if we are reaching for something like a dumbbell and we are going to have to utilize more force to be able to carry that dumbbell versus a coffee cup. Next, let's talk about wave summation. So here our fibers are stimulated while a previous twitch is still occurring. So you could see that best over here. We have one twitch over here. And then before this muscle gets to fully relax, we are sending in a second stimulus, which causes more calcium to move out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, causing contraction, and we can build upon that tension. And this is happening over and over again until we get the tension that we need. Now, sometimes we have an incomplete tetanus where the muscle tension is going to rise until the peak point, which is about three to four times greater than a single twitch. And this is going to have a short relaxation phase after each contraction. That is what we are seeing over here. 
when we look at this graph over here, we're seeing more of the complete tetanus. So that means we get that stimulus frequency high enough where we never have this little relaxation period and it just starts to build that tension, tension consistently and the relaxation phase disappeared completely and contractions are continuous. If you have not been using your muscle, sometimes you are going to have TREP take place. Our muscle contractions will become more efficient over time, but when the muscle is dormant, then we have to activate it. And so we have some initial contractions here which generate about half of the force that we will see in the later contractions. So notice how this muscle contraction here has a higher amount of tension than what we started with. And the muscle tension is going to start to increase with every contraction like a staircase. So this is called the staircase effect. There are three different muscle fiber types. We have our slow twitch oxidative, which you can see are in this red color, and they are going to allow for long distance running. So running a marathon, you want to have a lot of slow twitch oxidative muscle fibers. Then we've got kind of the in-between muscle fiber, which is called our fast twitch oxidative muscle fiber. And lastly, we have our fast twitch glycolytic, which are these more white muscle fibers. These are going to be really great at shorter distance or um, short bursts of energy. So if you are a sprinter, this is kind of the muscle fibers that you would want to have. Let's explore each one of these muscle fibers, starting with our slow twitch oxidative. When we contract more slowly and see that they are smaller in diameter, we will have better blood supply to this muscle fiber and more mitochondria to create more ATP and be able to have more endurance. So they are fatigue resistant when compared to the fast muscle fiber. We will also see a large amount of the myoglobin protein, which if you remember, this is a protein that can bind small amounts of oxygen for when we need it. We see slow twitch muscle fibers, mostly making up our postural muscles and more within our lower limb muscles than our upper limb muscles. And they tend to be darker fibers. So when we were looking at this previous slide, they were the darker red in here. So if you were looking at your your whole chicken that you've cooked, the dark fibers in there are the slow twitch muscle fibers. Then we've got our fast twitch oxidative fibers. These have fast contractions and are primarily used in aerobic respiration. So they can produce quite a bit of ATP, but they can switch to anaerobic respiration if they need to. These can fatigue quickly, especially when compared to slow twitch muscle fibers. And lastly, we have our fast twitch glycolytic muscle fibers. These respond rapidly to nervous stimulation and contain myosin that can break down ATP more readily than that in type one or the slow oxidative muscle fibers. We will see that there is less blood supply to this muscle fiber and fewer and smaller mitochondria because we are not really utilizing them to go through the aerobic respiration process. We will find these within the lower limbs, within sprinters and upper limbs in most people and it would be the white meat within chicken. It can come in that oxidative form that we saw in the previous slide, and this that we described is really our glycolytic form. Now what about exercise and muscle performance? If we are aging and not um, having enough resistance exercise or resistance training, we can develop sarcopenia, which is an age-related muscle atrophy. It is amazing how quickly the muscle can break down and atrophy when you don't utilize them. Then we've got for endurance exercise, we're going to utilize more of those slow twitch muscle fibers. So we don't need a lot of force, but lots of repetitions in order to keep up that endurance of the muscle fibers. Our aerobic metabolism 
used helps to maintain those contractions over a long period of time. And as we exercise, we can increase the amount of myoglobin in the cell that can hold on to that oxygen. And we usually find this protein within the sarcoplasm, within the cytoplasm of our muscle cell. And when we train, we can also trigger formation of more extensive capillary networks around these muscle fibers. And this process is called angiogenesis. So this is before training. We've got our capillaries there, but not as much of a um, cross-section of our capillaries surrounding the fibers as we see over here after training. Let's talk a bit more about resistance training. This is going to require large amounts of our fast twitch muscle fibers to produce those short, powerful movements that are not repeated over long periods of time, especially if you are only doing, let's say, three reps. You're going to probably lift a heavier weight and you need lots of power within that movement. So trained athletes are going to possess even higher levels of fast twitch muscle fibers. And the last thing we'll discuss here is how training increases the formation of myofibrils and that increases the thickness of the muscle fibers which result in hypertrophy. So we could see that taking place over here. It is gained by the addition of structural proteins and increasing the number of sarcomeres and the myofibrils. So remember, we're not increasing the number of um, muscle fibers or muscle cells, but rather the sarcomeres within them and the myofibrils. There's no significant increase in the mitochondria or capillary density, and we see increases in the development of the connective tissue that surround the muscle cells and the fascicles and the entire muscle itself. And the tendons become stronger and so in order to gain greater muscle mass, we need that intensity to also continually and gradually increase. That is it for your chapter 10 video lecture. Please let me know if you have any questions. Are very rigid.